Hey everybody, welcome back to Inside Man United. My name is Rowan Brennan. Thanks for joining me again. Today's episode, we're going to be focusing on the squad that Ten Hag has to choose from with some players now leaving, some players out of form. Uh, with Mason Mount's injury and with some time left in the window. Uh, how are United going to respond to the first two games that they've played? Not a lot of people have been covering themselves in glory. There is a worrying lack of cohesion across the different lines on the United team, from defence to midfield to attack. A lot of players not turning up. Uh, with recent injuries to Mason Mount, obviously Mason Greenwood being gone, Anthony Martial being far from fitness, Rashford off the boil, etc., etc. Ten Hag has some very big decisions. Uh, the main one, in in my opinion, and in the opinion of a lot of other people, would be one Anthony and whether he should be keeping his uh, space on the starting lineup, even on the bench at this stage. So let's get into it. News has just come out that Mason Mount has sustained an injury and will now be out for the next two games against Nottingham Forest and, of course, Arsenal. Is he actually injured? Is the question everyone is asking. For a very obvious reasons, does Eric Ten Hag want to take Mason Mount out of the firing line? Mason Mount has not been playing very well. Um, he didn't play well for his final year in Chelsea. A lot of people, including myself, did not understand why Mason Mount was being bought. When you look at what James Madison has been doing for Tottenham, I would always prefer James Madison over Mason Mount. But Mason Mount has won two Chelsea Player of the Year awards during successful spells when they actually won silverware and were doing reasonably okay. The guy clearly has talent, but he has not translated it onto the pitch at any stage at United, not during preseason and certainly not for the first two games of the season. We're not even seeing flashes of what he can do. He's running around a lot. He's very busy. Um, but he's now sustained an injury, whether that is Eric Ten Hag taking Mount out of the firing line because he can't really drop his new £60 million signing that was supposed to rejuvenate the midfield, provide energy and impetus. What it has, in fact, done is exposed us. Now, Eriksson was seen as someone that didn't have the energy to sustain 90 minutes. I think everyone can agree that's the case for obvious reasons due to his heart condition and his age. Uh, but we were a very strong midfield three. The connection between Eriksson, Fernandez, and Casemiro when it started to click uh, early last season was very potent. It was one of the strongest pieces of the United team. Mason Mount was supposed to make that even stronger, to provide more energy, more fitness, um, to help bring the attack and the defense together even more so than it already had with Ericsson, Fernandez, and Casemiro. Now, Fernandez and Ericsson, they're not known for their speed. Now, Fernandez has an engine on him like Ji Sung Park. I mean, the guy can just go go forever. His, he's got great fitness. He doesn't miss games. He doesn't come off early. He's there playing 90 minutes, nearly 50 games a season. His place is never in doubt. But he's not a defensive player. And while he has played deep in the past, he's not a deep-lying midfielder generally. He does like to play in more advanced positions. Therefore, Mount was brought in to be a number eight. He's supposed to be playing deeper and helping out Casemiro. Eriksen is not known for his defensive contributions, either is Fernandez. Yet Casemiro looked a world-class player playing beside those two. Um, Tony Cruz and Luka Modric, both very inventive, technically gifted, forward-thinking players, even though Modric uh, does tend to, to lie a little bit deeper, and that's what he did. He helped Casemiro out. Uh, Eriksen and Fernandez both did that. Ever since Mount has come in, both he and Fernandez have been very advanced, leaving Casemiro isolated. We look weaker, severely weaker, um, as a result of Mason Mount's inclusion in that midfield. Now, whether that's down to poor tactics, bad coaching, Mason Mount just not getting how we play, um, it, it could be a mixture of all three. Who knows? But Mason Mount's injury now removes him from the lineup to the Nottingham Forest game. And to be honest, I am glad not to see him injured. Uh, of course, but I'm glad that he is has been essentially forcibly removed. It removes any speculation and scandal over Eric Tanha dropping Mount. Is he finished at the club? Is he not up to it? And all the usual guff that comes out from the media when something like this happens. So this injury um, 
is going to have to facilitate a reshuffle. Uh, I do think you're going to see Ericsson coming back into the fold, uh, playing as the original midfield trio that we saw last year. With Kobe Mainu injured, he was certainly going to be coming in and providing energy and legs uh, for that midfield three. He'd done remarkably well in preseason. He was included in the strongest 11 lineup that we had against Dortmund, unfortunately came off early. There's big plans for Kobe Mainu. I think that much is, is clear. Scott McTominay seems to be close to a move out of the club if rumors are to be believed in what's happening in the last week. However, Scott, the, the, this is where Scott McTominay is required. I don't think Danny, Donny van der Beek is going to be included. Scott McTominay has not been really used all that much in the first two games of the season. It's quite clear and it has been widely agreed upon lots of different fan channels and pundits alike that McTominay is being managed out of the club. He's not really being relied upon or called upon to come in um, uh, uh, until the final couple of minutes, really. But this does look like a chance for McTominay to come in and provide some energy, some... Uh, some toughness, really, uh, to sit a little bit lower, help Casemiro out and stop allowing him be so exposed. So Mason Mount's exclusion, who comes in instead? It looks like it's going to be Ericsson. I can't see Donny or Scott McTominay coming in as a starter. However, Ericsson's not going to be able to complete 90 minutes, most likely. So who's going to be coming in to provide some rest for Ericsson after 60, 65, 70 minutes. Who knows? It might be McTominay. I would imagine it probably will be, um, but it remains to be seen. The big question hanging over Ten Hag's head is what he's going to do with his wingers and the attacking players. Garnacho got the nod again uh, against Spurs and was again largely ineffective and hauled off. Uh, his form has abandoned him. Uh, the the Garnacho we saw of last year is not present. For what reasons? I don't know. We can only speculate. Second season syndrome, it remains to be seen. I think what's clear is that a, a definite reshuffle is required. Uh, can, Ten Hag showed a, a little bit of vote of confidence and some faith in his players, if not in himself and the formation and tactics that he wanted to play against Spurs by having an unchanged team from Wolves. Many people were shocked at that. Um, maybe he was hoping to prove all the doubters wrong and know I am right and know these players can do it. And for 30 to 35 minutes, United actually started looking like a team that could play. They were pushing Tottenham back. They were capitalizing on mistakes and creating chance after chance after chance. Our profligacy in front of goal and our lack of being able to put it in the onion bag. And, you know, Fernandez, Anthony, Rashford, all missing chances that they ordinarily should have been putting away. Um, it could have been a very different scoreline and the dark clouds currently hanging over Man United uh, would not be there, at least for now. However, they didn't put the ball away and Garnacho did play poorly. And I think it's time for him to just go back onto the bench and put Marcus back out on the left in his more comfortable position. He was our standout best player last year and we're now playing him out of position. Would Arteta or Guardiola be playing their top players out of position? They've known to do reshuffles. Um, certainly with the back line with Guardiola, he's he's played people in unusual positions, but it's worked and it's done well. Um, I'm also a believer that if you're a good footballer and you're on the pitch, you should be able to pretty much play anywhere and put in a put in, put in a pretty reasonable shift. Um, however, I do understand the players have their specialties and they have the areas of the pitch that where they're most effective. So it, I think it's high time that we put Marcus back out on the left. What does that mean for the top positions? It is believed Hoyland could be on the bench for the Forest game. So people looking forward to seeing him at least in the track suit on the bench uh, and potentially getting some minutes. Um, but who starts up front? Will it be Sancho as a false nine? Who knows? The main issue for Eric Ten Hag and Man United at the moment is Anthony. Now, Anthony has his own issues hanging over him in a very similar vein to what Green would have. There is domestic violence, accusations hanging over him. How true they are, who knows? We also have to take into account that, obviously, this does not apply to Mason Greenwood. The evidence is overwhelming. But players in very privileged, um, wealthy positions are subjected to all sorts of scandals, blackmail, um, all the time. It's very, very common. It's not unusual. Um it, it, it does happen. So these accusations is not to say that Anthony has done anything wrong, but even if you are an innocent man, it's still stress. It's still something you don't have to deal with. But since these accusations have come out, have we seen a, a starkly different Anthony to what we saw last year? Anthony did okay in moments last year, but in the Premier League, he only got four goals and two assists. 
Now, was that down to players up front not putting the ball away? Veghorst not being as effective as he should have been? Um, some missed chances? Sure, sure. Um, but he wasn't great last year. And he's been very poor this year to the extent where United fans are starting to kind of ask questions of him and of Eric Ten Hag. This is Ten Hag's man. And it's our record signing, like a hundred million quid for this kid. And I say it, I've said it before, um, the Eredivisie is a very tricky league. There's a lot of talent. I'm not saying world-class players can't come from every league in the world, uh, all over the continent. Of course, amazing talent rests everywhere. But certain leagues can flatter to deceive. There's tier one leagues like the Premiership in Spain. They're tier one, they stand above everyone else. Um, Italy is now a tier two league. They're broke. What about Inter Milan and what about AC? They got very advanced in the Champions League. We do get freaks every now and again. Um, we've had, you know, Monaco and Porto in the final stages of a Champions League when the teams back then, there was probably far more strength and far more consistency back then than there was last year. There was a lot of teams in transition, a lot of teams not in the competition, um, a lot of teams playing poorly. Um, it, it was just one of those seasons where the top teams weren't really on it. Um, the Eredivisie has pucks of talent in it. Fantastic players come from there. Luis Suarez was the most recent kind of superstar to come out of the Eredivisie. But it's a risky league to be spending anywhere north of 50 million quid on a player. We look at that Ajax team that um, a Ten Hag managed. They got to the semi-final. They won the Dutch double. They they looked like world beaters. They could, they could play anyone. Um, that was kind of testament to Ten Hag and his tactics. Haller was up front. He'd already been at West Ham and bombed out of the league. Duzan Tadic has already been in the Premier League, also bombed out, and they were their two most potent strikers. Had they never played in the Premiership, I have no doubt there would have been 40, 50 million pound bids from the Premier League had they not already seen what these players failed to do when they did get their chance. Hakim Ziyech, bombed out of Chelsea. Uh, Donny van de Beek, 40 million quid, has never got his uh, career on track. You could say injuries, etc. When he came on, he was largely ineffective, went to Everton, couldn't even get in that team. Um... Martinez and Onana, of course, have done well. Uh, Jurian Timber, unfortunately, got injured. He is high quality. Gravenberch went to Bayern Munich, can't get a look in. They do have a strong midfield. The guy's only 21. But this this was a hugely talented team, lauded for its ability all across the pitch. Every single part of the pitch had a potential worldie there. A lot of them have been given a chance, and they failed their audition spectacularly. So to spend north of 40, 50, 60 million quid on an import from, from the Eredivisie, from Portugal, even from Italy. We've seen the likes of Gonzalo Higuain, who did well at, uh, at Real Madrid, but went to Italy, did very well, got his chance at Chelsea, didn't work out. Shevchenko, same thing. Edin Dzeko, a very good striker. He could have made it at any Premier League club, but he did have Con Aguero in front of him. He goes to Italy, tore it up. He was he was decent in the Premier League, but he's looked excellent in, in, in Italy. Uh, Giroud. A very good player, but was kind of in and out of teams. W wasn't really favoured by Arsenal fans when he was there. Um, was in and out of the Chelsea team. I, I like Giroud. He's done amazing things with France. and He was a sub at Chelsea. And he he didn't light it up with, with Arsenal either. He, he was a, a decent striker, but never got prolific. Um, ever since he's moved to Italy, he's he's been a revelation. Um, he's been fantastic for Milan. So these leagues can can they can pull up some tricky kind of stuff, and it's hard to bank on a sixty million pound player playing in one of those leagues, being able to translate it to the Premiership. Anthony was originally going to be bought for forty million quid. Uh, I think that was a fair price for a player that showed some promise, but due to a a mix of circumstances, namely Ajax hemorrhaging players and United bidding Anthony later in the window than other players had left, namely Graven Birch and other players like that. Uh, they were, I think Haller went to Dortmund. They were hemorrhaging players and the price just went up and up and up. Now, there comes a stage where Eric Ten Hag could have gone, listen, I've worked with this guy. He's not a hundred million pound player. Like that, that is serious, serious money. Uh, you're looking for the finished article. You're looking for a world-class complete player that comes in for that kind of money, who's going to have an immediate and very sizable impact on the team from the first game. That's it. Now, Grealish had a slow start to life at City, but he's now a mainstay in a team that has an awful lot of rotation in it. Um, Grealish has nailed down that left attacking spot after having a fairly kind of shaky start to life at City. I think it took time for him to get used to Pep's 
style of play. He wasn't the main man like he was at Villa. He was a cog in a larger machine. And I think he's adapted to that role pretty well. But like Dembele to Barcelona, Griezmann to Barcelona, um, Darwin Nunes from Benfica. I mean, 100 million is a huge amount of money. And Ten Hag backed his boy. He said, yeah, spend the 100 million on him. He's worth it. So there's a huge amount of pressure on Anthony to perform, and he hasn't. There's a huge amount of pressure on Ten Hag to justify that decision. And it hasn't worked out. And he is persisting with it. So there comes a time when, are you willing to put him on the bench and admit that he is out of form? Or are you going to persist in showing the world that you were right to spend that money to, to help him maintain his confidence? Sometimes you can destroy a guy's confidence if you just keep playing him and he keeps underperforming. Sometimes you need to take him out of the firing line, put him on the bench, give someone else a chance, show other members of the squad that you can play yourself into the team and you know, sh- show the leadership that you were brought in to show. If you've got a £100 million player that's underperforming, you can't persist with it because you're too stubborn to admit you got it wrong. Anthony is very poor at the moment. He is stinking the place out. It's not even we're getting flashes of 15, 20 minutes, but he's inconsistent. Sancho would be good for 5, 10, 15 minutes. So some, so, so, some um, you know, flashes of, of talent. Anthony's doing nothing. He's receiving the ball, cutting in on his left, taking a shot and missing. Ad nauseum. And it's starting to really grate on, on United uh, fans at the moment. Anthony needs to be removed. I think Palistri should be given a chance. Ama Diallo, I don't know whether he's injured at the moment, but Ama Diallo should be given a run. Palistri has shown a lot more in the 15 minutes that he's been given um, when he replaces Anthony than Anthony does for the 75 minutes preceding him. Palistri, I believe, has played his way into the team in as much as the way Garnacho has now played himself out of it. Palistri should start. Or Sancho should start on the right, but we don't have a striker. So Sancho has to play as the false nine. And Palistri should be started on the right and Rashford should be put on the left. And then it's going to be Ericsson, Casemiro and Fernandez last year's middle three. And that should be the lineup against Forrest. Anthony needs to be benched. He needs to be shown that you're playing yourself out of this team. And he needs to start pulling up his socks and figuring out that there's more to his game than just cutting in onto, the le- uh, c- cutting in onto his left foot and squeezing the opposition defense together to allow fewer opportunities for those central players that we have. He needs to start going out wide and stretching opposition defenses, but he's not. The predictability in which he plays is grating and he needs to be taken out of the team and Palistri needs to be given a shot. There's talk about Palistri going out on loan to maybe Sheffield United. Um, I'd like to see him go to another Premier League team. He did go to Alaves last year. He had a decent start, but it, you know, it, it, it started to unravel a little bit. Um, they don't play like we do in England, um, uh, in Spain. They just don't. Uh, he needs to be given a loan move within the, the Premiership. I don't want to see him go out on loan. I want to see him push Anthony for a starting place. Anthony needs to have that pressure. With Greenwood gone now, I'm a Diallo kind of in and out. Is he going to be going on another loan? Uh, we need more competition for the right. It was a weak, it was a weak point for us when Alanga was there. That's why we bought Sancho. Now Sancho seems to be only available to play as a false niner on the left when we originally bought him to be on the right. And now we don't have Diallo. Greenwood is gone. Anthony's off the boil. Can we afford to put Palistri on loan? Absolutely not. Has he been playing better than Anthony on the right hand side when he's been given chances? One hundred percent. He should be given a starting berth. Uh, ahead of Anthony on um, on Saturday against Nottingham Forest. Whether that will happen remains to be seen, but I think Rashford needs to be put out onto the left. Sancho needs to be put in as a false nine, and Pellistri needs to start on the right-hand side. That's it for now. Uh, what do you think? What do you think we should be doing? Should Sancho start out on the right? Should we put Rashford down the middle and leave Garnacho on the left? Uh, should we bring in Pellistri, drop Anthony, Sancho through the middle, and put Marcus out on his preferred left? What would you do with the midfield? Uh, would you bring in McTominay to give Casemiro some help? Would you prefer to see the old trio of Fernandez, Eriksen, and Casemiro at the back? Leave your comments below. Thanks for joining me. I will see you next time.